Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast which is like reading in your car, but much safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me are my fabulous co-hosts... I'm Diana. <laughs> and I'm Jackie. Hi, with everyone. With a hat on. With a hat on. How's everyone doing? I'm good. I'm cold right now. It's randomly cold today. Yeah, it was snowing today in Boston. We had some whiteout conditions this morning. I'm wearing a hat, and I have a blanket skirt on and a blanket cape on. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm drinking tea. And what month is it? It's April. <laughs> Welcome to April. Awesome. <laughs> well, so we braved the weather today to come to talk to you about novel behavior. So we'll be reading not one, not two, but three articles. Or, well, we Whoa. read them. We'll talk about three You articles. get a bonus. Bonus! article this week. Don't say we never did nothing for you out there. <laughs> so let's get into this discussion of novel behavior. Now, before we get into the articles, I wanted to ask about the concept of the lag schedule, because two of these articles very specifically talk about the lag schedule. And, you know, it, it made sense in the context of the articles, but to be honest, it's not uh, a reinforcement schedule I'm very familiar with. So could somebody give, not me, I, I totally get it now, but our listeners... Uh, a little bit of a description about... Hypothetically speaking. <laughs> Some, someone might not know what this is, and I feel bad for them. So would one of you or both of you please talk a little bit about what is a lag schedule? Where do we see them? Where are they used? Sure. Um, so a lag schedule is a re- schedule of reinforcement, but it just happened to get a super special name. Um, which is it's just special for it. I For a while, I thought that it was capitalized. So it was like, what's that called? An acronym? Yeah, LAG. Oh. Right, an LAG schedule. And I was like, what does that stand for? Like, latency. Adjusted growth. For goodies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's not. It's just, it's just lag, like lowercase. Um, and a lag schedule refers to only providing reinforcement for some type of novel response. Right, so a general reinforcement schedule response could be the same each time, and you're going to get reinforcement for it. But with a lag schedule, and you can have a lag schedule with a number after it, right? So a lag one, a lag two, a lag three. So let's use a lag one as an example. In a lag one reinforcement schedule, you get, you are only going to receive reinforcement for that response if it differs from the immediately preceding response. Okay. Okay. A lag two schedule, the Current response must be different from the preceding two responses. Mm-hmm. Lag three, the preceding three responses, and on and on and on. Okay. Pretty cool. Yeah. It's one way we can discuss, you know, creativity. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a great way to expand behavior, um, bring in novel or new topographies and forms of behavior, and um, is our best method from a behavioral perspective of understanding things like creativity. Okay. Well, thank you for explaining that. For, Hypothetically. For someone who, yeah, who, who didn't understand. Well, to be honest, when say. I was in a when I was in my master's program and I read, I think the first time I came across lag schedule, I didn't look at what it meant. I was just like, oh, there's something I don't know. I'm just going to read over it. Was <laughs> <laughs> well, so you just skipped it? Yeah. So I just skipped over it. I was like, it's a schedule. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but it's it's good to know what it actually is. And it I, is, it's actually not a, even a difficult concept. No, it's it just not. gets a no. super special name, so it feels super high tech. I thought it had something to and do like with basic, like, it feels oh, really like basic research. Yeah, well, I forgot to reinforce you. I'm I'm, I'm lagging behind in my reinforcement. <laughs> so when you reinforce someone poorly hours after the fact, <laughs> that's not real reinforcement. No, I, I know. That's <laughs> I guess it would get a special name because it's it would it would mean BS reinforcement schedule, <laughs> right. I suppose. <laughs> That's something else entirely. <laughs> well, we'll talk about BS reinforcement schedules <laughs> another another time. Now that we've discussed what a lag schedule is, let's sort of talk about how that relates to the development of novel behavior. So we're going to start with an article by Gertz, Gertz and Bear from Java from 1973. It's oldie. But it's a but seminal it, article. That's why we're reading it. Mm-hmm. Oh my re- gosh, yeah. It's really important that when you start reading these up-to-date articles... That you go back to the roots and read those first articles because then you can see, you know, where it started and how far we've come. Mm -hmm. Very true. So this article is Social Control of Form Diversity and the Emergence of New Forms in Children's Block Building. Now, uh, Diana, you're going to talk about this article. Uh, I I don't think block building has really been much of a, a line of research recently. So how does this relate to our topic? 
No, there hasn't been much of a line in block building research. A lot of replication, guys. <laughs> taking a page from your book. I'm, I'm going to be... I'm going to be the one talking about research today, I think. Okay. <clears throat> I've heard three episodes of the show, so... Pro! Pro. You're, you're on the inside track. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you're right. There hasn't been a lot of research in block building. Um, but this... You know, I love looking at the old articles because they weren't concerned sometimes with, like, the nitty-gritty of what they were doing. It was how it related to the overall, like, their overall mission Mm -hmm. in this new field of behavior analysis, which was, there there were some really nice, you know, like, idealistic aspects of this article. Like, look at what we can do Mm -hmm. with reinforcement. Reinforcement is this amazing tool, and look, we can change all kinds of things, and that's what they were talking about here. So they just happened to be... Looking at children's block building, but I feel like they were really trying to relate it to the overall picture of look how powerful this reinforcement tool is. Not only can we increase behavior, we can increase new behavior. Mm-hmm. I love this article. This is one of my all-time favorite articles, actually. All right, why don't you tell us, uh, give us, give us the rundown. Will do. All right, so um, in this article, they. There were three participants. They were four-year-old preschool girls who were all typically developing. And it, it says in, in the article they did not have much in common, <laughs> with the exception that none of them uh, uh, appeared to enjoy building with blocks. So they never picked blocks to build with, usually on their own. And when they did pick blocks, they didn't engage in building novel structures. And in the 70s, block building was part of the national curriculum. We were trying to beat the Russians to build a block tower to the moon. That's right. A nation of block builders is what they called us. One thing I think is kind of crazy that they talk about with the participants is they say one subject came from a low-income family and then semicolon. The other two represented highly enriched intellectually and culturally (laughs) stimulating family (laughs) situations. I don't think those two need to be... uh, what? That's how research was back then. Though, I know, so but here's a tangent. I don't think those need to be like, oh, they're low income, so they can't be culturally stimulating. They can't be right. highly enriched. Like that. That seems a little, the dichotomy there. Oh, I mean, that was th- wasn't that the the subject of meaningful differences two years yeah, later? So it, maybe it, it was, was hot on everyone's mind. Yeah, and, yeah like, good point. Poor yeah. people. <laughs> but like, poor that one subject, low income family. We don't have to, anything to say about them. But these other two. <laughs> Highly enriched, <laughs> intellectually and culturally. I wonder if they knew, like, those families. Oh, it must... Yeah, it was their buddies. Because like, it was the university right. preschool. Oh. Yeah, so, so yeah, wondering. they totally did. And I was going to say, how, I, yeah, well, how they know I, how I intellectually know, enriched they were. And then I hope at some point all three of these families read this article and they tried to guess which one. Are we the low-income family? <laughs> or are we one of the ones that are highly stimulating? An intellectual. Right. So I'm sure they were trying to set up, you know, what is the home life like yeah. for these families? Is it uh, an enriched environment that they're in? So did they have opportunity to play with blocks? Or did they have someone who was maybe showing them how to play with blocks diversely? I mean, maybe. True. But they, it's way maybe, overstatement. Yes. Uh, maybe they just want to explore the fact that not everyone is good at blocks. You know, it, it can be tough. Anyone could be a bad block builder in any family. That's true. You know. I'm also a bad block builder. I give Are up you? rather quickly. Yeah, I could actually use this this uh, experiment to increase my block building skills. I'll sit next to you next time. And Thank you, and be like, crazy. "Whoa, <laughs> that's an arch. That one's different. Yeah. A flying buttress, or whatever this." <laughs> um, well, I did wonder when I was reading this. I was like, "I, I wish they'd done a follow up study with these." <laughs> Yeah. Little girls as Where adults. Where are they now? Yeah. Like, Architects. What did they end up doing? <laughs> you know? block building do do they so have crazy. like creative type jobs or are they really happy with their like rote job that they do? When they, <laughs> they, maybe they really are not creative people. <laughs> I hope that one of the girls is the founder of Goldie Blocks. Oh, that would be cool. What's Wouldn't go- that be cool? Goldie, Goldie Blocks is blocks for girls and you... And our new sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. Um, they're they're like Legos for girls, but they come with a book about like like building building a castle for the princess and... Um, but they incorporate like, say, like the scientific method. And right. It's not just like Lego, Lego girl blocks, which are just pink. Yeah. And okay. you can't have a job, you know, you can only, like... Uh, there are Legos where you're in, like, pet. a magical elf land. That's a cool job. Elf. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to be when I no, grow up. But the oh, Goldilocks one ones... The Goldilocks ones that are actually educational. Yeah. I actually really... I want them for myself. I tried to buy them cool. for my niece, but they were... 
like three hundred dollars, so I did oh. not buy. It's like a kit. Oh, yeah, it's like a very. You can get like I wanted to get the whole set. Oh. Um, and she lives in Hawaii, so I. Ugh, every, sending anything there is like atrocious. So Yikes! I'll wait okay. till she comes back. There you go. So lots to do with blocks. Uh, anyway, Diana, let's get into the rest of the the rest of the article. Sure. Um, so, you know, these three g- girls were identified as their block building behavior was lacking of concern. <laughs> so the researchers, they wanted to see how their block building behavior responded when they added in differential um, praise for either building novel forms within a session or building the same form over and over during the session. So, you know how we just went through the lag schedules, mm-hmm. Rob? Yes. We talked about lag one, lag two, lag three. This, um... This article doesn't talk about lag schedules. It, I don't know if the term was around, actually, in 1973. I don't think we have reference to it in, in our literature from that time period. No, and well, then the later articles don't actually... I don't believe they cited this article, did they? Mm-mm. No. So, so I'm, I'm guessing that it somehow doesn't all connect, or it's so old that there's been enough research since then that they don't feel the need to yeah. go back to it. Um, it seems like the first time they talked about lag schedules was Paige and Nuringer in 1985. Okay, yeah. So this was 12 years before that, so we we don't know if that term was around or if they made it up later. So anyway, but with the lag schedule, it's lag one, lag two, lag three, and you're reinforcing just based on the previous one or two responses. So for this study, they were looking at the entire session, which was anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes in length. And for um, reinforcement to be given for a novel response, it could not have occurred at any point during that session. So it was a little bit more of a stringent criterion than just the, the straight lad schedule. So they just uh, referred to it as, they actually just uh, talked about reinforcing novel forms. So they had an initial baseline in which they gave no particular um, praise for building. They just looked to see what types of forms the children, the children built. And then they had um, a condition in which they reinforced novel forms. And they pre-identified 20 different forms that you can make with blocks. And I loved this. They, they give a table. They define all the 20 different forms. <laughs> and they're awesome. You know, I don't think I would have thought to make some of these things with blocks. But I'll just read to you some of the titles. Fence, Story, Ramp, Pillar, Post, Tower. So you can kind of imagine what all of those might look like. But then as the number, as the 20 forms go on, they get into things like simulation, interface, adjunct, subdivision, enclosure, elaborated balance. <laughs> okay. I mean, they, they define what they all are. It's just all these um, different ways you can put blocks together. But who would have thought to break it down and operationally define it to that degree? Were there, they were commercially available Video cameras, right? They tape, didn't they tape these sessions? Or no, no, God, they didn't. You're right. Oh, so they had someone observing in the session, a silent, an observer silently watched. It's like a nightmare it research job. Like just watch this kid, and you got to code all their yeah. block building. And then I realized the sessions are ten to twenty minutes in length. <gasps> um, so yeah, so they're watching them and recording as it's happening. Anytime they think they're seeing a new form of the twenty, which is you know pretty hard. <laughs> Um, and then additionally afterwards, they, after the children left this session, they went in and took a Polaroid picture from all different angles of the block scene so they could go back later and record in detail what blocks were there. Now, I, I also wondered what would happen if the child knocked the blocks over during the session. They didn't mention that at all. I don't know. Oh, These the, were very compliant them. little girls. Yeah. I mean, I guess it wouldn't count as novel behavior if they knocked it over. And then they no, I mean, they wouldn't be there. There'd be no permanent product. To... Oh, you mean like smashed their yeah, creation? Like, ah! was done? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're girls. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a boy monopoly. I see. Gotcha. Destruction. <laughs> it didn't they did seem like to be pretty though. compliant little girls. Right. So. It didn't seem like it happened because no. they didn't even bring it up. It didn't, didn't even occur to them. I mean, maybe the one from the low the income family. But the others oh. were culturally enriched. I mean, I don't think they'd knock over blocks. Just terrible. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's what they did in the reinforcement of novel forms condition. Is they any of these 20 things, the first time it was seen, the teacher who was present said, Oh, wow, look at that, an arch. That's different. How wonderful. <laughs> um, in that condescending tone of voice? Or? <laughs> that was my teacher voice. Oh, Rob, that's so great. <laughs> I know I look. did not go into actual teaching for children. <laughs> So they did that, 
And they saw an increase in novel form, certainly, for all three of the participants. Then they also did, and this was really nice, they did a reversal of that contingency. So they then provided the same type of condescending praise <laughs> for uh, building the same form over and over again. So they said, Which oh, I like. wow, yeah. another arch. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> wow, it's I know, tower. I loved that, right? So yeah. it wasn't just... And they were able to, to reverse that, and the children all went back to making more and more of the same form. And then they did a final um, condition where they reinforced novel forms again, and they saw the number increase. And how is this different? You say it's a reversal, but how is that different from withdrawal design? Just so that we're clear for everyone. Oh, certainly. So they're applying um, the reinforcement parameters to the behavior that they want to see increase as well as the converse of that behavior. So they're looking to see novel forms increase, but they also did a condition in which they reinforced same forms right? as well. So rather than just a baseline in which no reinforcement was present, they reinforced the converse of the behavior in question. Cool. Yeah. Can I just, has that always been a thing, reversal versus withdrawal, or is it just recently people have been more stringent about it. People aren't being stringent about it. We're being stringent. It's just us. Okay, that's fine because I always felt like, wait a minute, no, it's all I've been described as a a reversal. It's like you remove the, you remove the the treatment. You just remove the treatment. But that's a withdrawal. Reversal is you're actually reinforcing a different response. Something different. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, you know, they're used interchangeably a lot of the time. Oh, yeah. No, I'm totally cool that there's a difference. I just wanted to make sure that it was not like, oh, God, everyone knows this but me. No. No. Definitely not. So let's talk some results. So if you I praise did. it, did you? I did. Oh, the, you went the through graph the graph is lovely. It uh, it's very simple. You can see it beautifully as a um, reversal design with an initial baseline. They don't use phase lines, which is a little weird. And then, but then I do like that each of the data points is a letter, so it's representing the name of the conditions. So there's a no reinforcement, which has little ends as each data point. D, which is reinforcing different forms, and S, which is reinforcing the same form. So um, everyone should take a look at the graph. It's really cool. It's mm-hmm. a cute little graph. It is. It's like so clean. And um, everyone had very similar results in that praise was highly effective at increasing n- novel form building for Sally, Kathy, and Mary. My favorite graph is figure two. Oh, yeah. Where they look at the, the cumulative number of new forms in the course of the block building training. Mm-hmm. So as training goes on, you see for all the participants that novel block building increases when you're reinforcing only different forms, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And then when they were reinforcing the same, there was no increase during those sessions. Right. It's so interesting to think about that because it's typically developing kids. Um, we don't think about their play as something that we need to diversify. You know, oh, they're right. playing, that's great, we'll talk about their play. But I never really thought about, oh, let's try to make them do something different or make a car. Like, as, like, a teachable, or like a teachable moment. Right, yeah. Or a typical developing kid. Nobody wants to think about that, because it's very hard. Right, yeah, can kids. you just, can they, you I, mean, I, I was shocked reading this article. It just sort of felt like, and you tell them, great job, and whatever you want to happen will just happen. It, was, <laughs> it's, it felt way too pat. And I don't know if it's because they use typically developing students, because, you know, I mean, and they use both poor and well-off students, too, you know, <laughs> I mean, that... Right. So, but it's it's very rarely that simple. I mean, even with typically developing kids, if you just praise them for other phrases, I mean, anecdotally, it's hit or miss if you're going to get results. And again, right. maybe if I really took the time to graph it and I looked and coded the student's play, um, I, I don't know, maybe it's the generation of helicopter parents these days. Like the kids are just totally attenuated to the idea of an adult constantly talking to them while they play, but they sometimes don't care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Take so, on point. Let your kids play alone sometimes. Yes, please. It's a good idea. Unless they just do the same thing over and over again. <laughs> Which case, go praise them for Which their case, novel behavior. Yeah. Praise, praise, praise. All right. <clears throat> so this article is sort of, you know, when people talk about, say, A Citizen Kane, like, oh, it's such a great movie, but only because it was one of the first. This article is seminal in the sense <laughs> that it's so old. What you got against Citizen Kane? I don't have anything against Citizen Kane. But I've you never watch- even seen it. But you know, I mean, if you watched it, you'd be like, "What? Spoiler Why would alert. I be impressed?" <laughs> because they're using all these techniques, but the techniques at the time were were really novel. So similarly, the idea of if you reinforce something, it increases is not a novel concept. Is it just the fact that it was done in a different time when all of this was new enough that just showing how it could work and how it could be applicable, rather than uh, just basic research, was 
was just hot and really cool and, and, and fascinating? I don't think so, because this study that we're going to talk about next was published in 2005 and has actually remarkably the same procedures. Yeah. Almost down to, like, it's as if they had read it but didn't cite it. Um, down but to, I don't, I don't but think that's the case. I no, think, I don't think so either. Um, I don't think this is a well-known article. Yeah. Gertz and Bear. Mm-hmm. 1973. Mm-hmm. But the the article that we're going to read next, um, the procedures are fairly similar, and they actually cite one of the limitations is what the the Gertz and Bear article did. So it's it's kind of interesting. So I don't think that it's because it was hot topic. I think. Yeah. No, no, but at, but, hot, but at, at the hot time. Hot topic at the mall. Hot topic. No, but at the, at the time, you know, like you were saying at the beginning, Diana, the sense of just the the buzz and excitement. I mean, six you know seventy three is not too long after Java had even started as a journal. Yeah, this is um, issue six. Yeah, so so the fact that this is, you know, I feel like if I went to Java with my article about like I told kids great job with their play and I coded all sorts of fancy stuff with their Legos and they got better at Legos. It, it doesn't feel like the sort of thing anyone would really care about. They're like, yep, that's how that works. Good job. You you solved no problem. <laughs> but <laughs> man, you are so tough on this article. I, I no, I like the article, but I like how you described it. Almost like it's a—I don't want to say historical curiosity, but just the sense. Well, of in a sense, yeah. It 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 kind of took a lot of the zeitgeist that was going on in the field to talk about the application. Sort of like if you go back and say read, um, you know, some of Skinner's original, not original works, but some of his later works where he just was so jazzed about behavior analysis. You're reading it, and you're like, this, I mean... The- Behavior <laughs> analysis. <laughs> I mean, it, but you said so yourself, the idea that... I, I think that, I mean, the founding fathers of ABA, of which Bear is one, yep. were at the core so ideological about what this was, and so excited about what ABA could do. And I think that this article taps into that, and I love it for that. But it's it's not simple to... Produce novel behavior. It's not. And that's something that even now we try to work on, right? So how can we produce yeah. creativity? How can we, you know, produce artists? This is, like, something that they talk about a ton um, in, like, behavior analysts and mm-hmm. junk. Yeah. I think it's a great topic, and it's there's very little out there. I mean, certainly, and we're going to talk more about, you know, working with a population with autism, trying to get novel behavior from that population is extremely difficult. But in general, trying to produce novel behavior is something that we still don't have that great a grasp on. So I think this is a relatively timeless article. There hasn't been a lot of follow-up on it, and I, I love it for that. I think mm-hmm. that it's just such a cool idea. Not to mention, in the discussion, so we, we get to move in this article, which is like five pages long, mm-hmm. <laughs> from talking about little girls block building to talking about dolphin gymnastics <laughs> in the discussion because they're trying to tie it into other research that's been done. There's very little out there, but um, they talk about Pryor, Hag, and O'Reilly who uh, used food reinforcers to increase different movements of porpoises. Oh. Novel porpoise movements. That's Karen Pryor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were able to do so so successfully that they could no longer, they couldn't think of additional names or ways to like categorize the dolphin movements so they had to like give up on what they were going to call these right. certain things and they're like they're just coming up with everything and i i love that too that we get to also talk about dolphin gymnastics in the course of this article it's a great one i, I, I like I'm it saddened, more Rob. well no i like it more the kind of taking in the context of sort of you know Gert, gertz and, and bear you know at a cocktail party i mean like and then we told her you know, it, it, that circle's great. And she kept making new block things. It was, oh my God, this reinforcement, I'm telling you. It's amazing. Can you believe it? I don't, it's different bigger designs. than that. It's bigger but than to that. be honest, you don't believe it because you already said, I don't believe that this actually worked. So even you didn't believe it, that it would work. Cause, but it does. What, that reinforcement changes? No, I, I believe that reinforcement changes behavior. Yeah, but you were like, I can't the believe... The magic of reinforcement. Yeah. <laughs> But you're like, I can't believe that just saying good job, then she would make different blocks. It would be hit or miss. You said that just mm-hmm. earlier. They have a pretty small sample size. I don't know. Mm, that's true. But pretty cool. Yeah. I think it's awesome. The end. Okay. I, I, I did not dislike <laughs> it. It was interesting. I, I appreciate the amount of work that went into it. And th- no, it's not a simple article in the sense that they had to code all of that. I mean, play, anything with play, 
is oh yeah, this seems a nightmare terrible. to yeah. try to code. Well, to try to code yeah. or... Yeah, yeah. Like, is that a balanced arch or an overhanging arch or whatever they were called? <laughs> How do we decide? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, so there's our, there's our kind of intro into the, into the novel behavior research field. And let's move on. Let's jump ahead into the future. Well, the past, but... <laughs> <laughs> the less the recent past. past. The recent past. But before we do that, let's go into one of our secret code words. So if you are listening to this podcast for CEs, thank you so much for choosing us as a means to learn new stuff. Uh, for every episode we do, you will need to recognize and write down the episode number and these code words. I'm going to give you the first one right now. The first one is monster. M-O-N-S-T-E-R. Monster. And that's our first code word, and we'll have the second one later in the episode. So, with that out of the way, let's continue on with Camilleri and Hanley. So use of a lag differential reinforcement contingency to increase varied selections of classroom activities from 2005's Java. Yeah, so this one uh, actually uh, cites Page and Neuringer 1985 as mm-hmm. the seminal article that talks about this lag schedule where there's a different reinforcement um, for a different response. I mean, there's a reinforcement for a different response, either one or two before, um, as we talked about. Um, and they also use typical, de- typically developing girls. Two typically developing girls. What's up with these typically developing girls? I don't know. No, Tina and Carol. Um, these students only chose activities that uh, had one set of skills from the curriculum. Um, they didn't vary back and forth. Uh, so they wanted to see if they could teach them to choose different activities. Um, so they had 12 activities during each session. They had programmed activities um, and non-programmed activities. So that was a little bit confusing for me, but they broke it down yeah. where the program activities were academically oriented and likely to result in measurable progress. And the non-program activities were not systematically designed. So, like, an example of a program activity was Math Facts, a computer-based instruction sequence in which participant learns to solve basic addition. And a non-program activity was Monkey Maze, which actually sounds really fun. <laughs> an, inter- ba- an internet-based computer game in which the player navigates a monkey through a series of mazes collecting diamonds while trying to avoid predators. Kind of sounds like Donkey Kong. No, I bet it looks like, like. I bet it looks like. Donkey oh, like, Kong. like Pac-Man. Is it a math game? No, it's just a non-program activity game. It's just oh, a okay. fun remember game. internet games in two thousand five? They were not. No, I didn't play internet good. games. The only game that I played on the internet was Jeopardy, and <laughs> yeah, it was pretty fun. Jeopardy and uh, Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail wasn't on the internet. That was on your Apple II. Oh yeah, just kidding. <laughs> in elementary school, <laughs> but that was fun. Um, yeah, you played that zombie one. Zombie oh, Oregon Trail. Yeah, Zombie Oregon Trail. That's a very good game. Sponsored by Zombie Oregon Trail. <laughs> so, so, so Jackie, they, these were little uh, girls who only picked one activity for their free time? Yeah. Is that the premise? Right. So they were looking to see could they increase both academically oriented tasks as well as Non-program. additional free play mm-hmm. yeah. tasks. Okay. Yeah, that's what they wanted to do. Um, so they collected data during 60-minute observations and... Collected data across three response categories, selection, engagement, and... Oh, number of academic units completed. Yeah, so gotcha. that's, what, that's what they're looking at. So they had 12 index cards on the table. All of them had the name of a different activity on it. Um, so there was six program activities and six non-program activities, and they told the student that they could select any activity and they could switch any activity at any time, which is kind of nice. And then they prompted activity choices every five minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they had baseline and intervention. And during baseline, they did not program any consequences for selecting activities. So they got to pick whatever they want. And intervention sessions were the same as those Um, In baseline, except that the first activity selection and then the novel selection in each 60-minute session resulted in the teacher handing the student a green card that could be traded in for two minutes of teacher attention. So if there was any novel responses, a green card was handed, you did it, and then they could train it at the end, which is 
fairly similar to what Bayer did in a sense. Yeah, I mean, both of these groups seem like they are motivated for teacher attention. Right. Yeah, but this one was a delayed reinforcement. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. And they didn't they didn't test for a reinforcement of attention. In, they did not know in either, no. so that would actually make it better. I mean, typically developing kids, you're going to assume, have a pretty high, uh, or pretty highly reinforced by adult attention. Right. And that's pretty standard. Yeah. But, so but yeah, it wasn't to. tested for. No. Um, so one difference in the the Camilleri article from the Gore article is that instead of reinforcing same forms, they just they did uh, a withdrawal back to baseline. So then they put any sort of uh, playing or choosing activities on extinction. So they had in in baseline they saw for Carol very low levels of novel selections, usually around one per sixty minute session. Um, and then upon implementation of the lag schedule, we actually saw a pretty big increase to 10 number of novel selections. Mm-hmm. Um, and then an immediate decrease uh, to around four or so when we go back to baseline again. And then we saw an immediate increase again for intervention um, up to 15. Woo woo! Go Carol! Um, <laughs> so yeah, a nice... You know, a nice demonstration of a functional relation here. Um, And then what they do, which is kind of neat, um, is they put all 12 activities along the y-axis. And then along the x-axis, they have the sessions. And then in each block of a session, they record the percentage of intervals that the student was actually engaged in the materials. Um, So, for instance, for Carol, during baseline, she basically played with blocks. 97% 97% of the time, all the way to like 100% of the time. And I wonder how many different forms she made. For those I, wonder, <laughs> I wonder, block building. <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically she just played with blocks. Um, but when we looked at intervention, it appeared that, you know, across sessions, she sampled at least every, it looks like every. Oh, yeah. Every activity. In, the, in, mm-hmm. the, in her second intervention. It's almost all of them. One yeah. session she engaged in with everything. Right. Um, So that's pretty cool is that you did see an increase in, you know, you didn't see, you saw a decrease in intervals within session, but you saw uh, novel selections across across sessions. And then they looked at the number of academic units completed, and in baseline, we saw very, in in, in both baseline sessions, uh, low responding um, of academic units completed, and, you know, a variable amount of academics uh, units completed within our intervention phase. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of, you saw a little bit of a change, but overall the level doesn't change very yeah. much. Well, it felt to me like it was pretty indirect right. that you would be reinforcing academics. You know, so only in the sense of hey, you picked something different, right? But not necessarily the content. I think they talked about that in the the discussion is limitation, the, the quality. They right. didn't talk about mm-hmm. you know, oh yeah, yeah, I'm playing, I'm doing my math sheet. Anyway, I picked something different. Yeah, yeah, it would have been a nice extension. It would. To then add an mm-hmm. additional reinforcement component for academic tasks. We actually do see an increase in um, number of academic units completed, though, for our second participant, Tina. Yeah. She has similar results um, when she looks at novel selections and across uh, the percentage of engagement. But we do see look at her when we look at her number of academic units completed um, in both intervention phases. Although the first intervention phase is a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, it demonstrates it's more the graphic teacher wants to see, and yeah, they'll right? spend all their time doing work now. Right, they're they're perfect. <laughs> so easy. Um, but they, you do see an increase, although it's not a ton for that second um, second intervention. It's up to you know seven academic units completed, up from you know it's like zero zero. zero. <laughs> so so that's I mean I think any teacher would be like thanks yeah uh, for that if they took data they would say thanks right, otherwise they'd say you know she spent. You know, only twenty percent of her time on academics. Therefore, your intervention failed. I don't want to take data. Right? Yeah. That's... Rob's not bitter. <laughs> what? That's a fact. It's a rock fact. <laughs> but yeah, so this is really interesting. So we we do see that this lag schedule uh, schedule can uh, promote variability in our novel selections um, across sessions for two participants. What's interesting for me here, though, is that. This may not be what we want to happen in, in a school setting. If you think about exactly. it, right? So I would want 
I would want my kid, instead of looking with blocks 95% of the time, maybe doing reading mm-hmm. 95% of the time. Mm-hmm. Right. So they do say that as a limitation, that maybe this may not be the most effective place to do this. Right. <laughs> right? Because we, we do want to see... We want to see behavioral persistence mm-hmm. across academic units. We don't want them to jump from math to English to... Right, and I think a lot that of that... A, no, sorry, Danny, go ahead. That was likely, you know, had to do with the, the setup of the study. Because every oh. five minutes they are prompting them to oh, change right. activity. Um, chances are, I mean, they don't mention that these students, you know, didn't engage with the class when needed to for the no, no, not at all. They were in a va- they were in a vacant classroom. Yes, this was just their free time. But I right. can see this being highly applicable at home. Oh yeah, you know, mm-hmm. hypothetically speaking, one's children might only want to play with one particular type of thing, such as a ball, <laughs> like throwing a ball <laughs> <laughs> up in True. the air or against the walls of your home. Um, so I could see how parents might be interested in expanding mm-hmm. novel uh, play selections. Mm-hmm. Yeah, perhaps. What yeah. were you going to say, Rob? Oh, uh, well, just in terms of applicability to, to a classroom. I think here you're talking about 2005 education, which was still kind of mired. Well, education still kind of mired in 20th century education skills, where the goal is to sit and work and be persistent so you can learn all the facts. Whereas nowadays, there is more and more of a push to have students moving around and talking and looking at problems from different ways and researching and then Mm -hmm. putting something together. So to some extent, there is going to be more of a push, would be hope, there is going to be more of a push to having students do lots of things within an academic block of time or, or not even having academic blocks of time so much as here's your project, here's some steps in between, go do it and you would want to have more variability. So That's you know true. what? That's you a may have a, a group of students who are in that cusp of, hey, everybody, we've suddenly all decided 21st century skills. I know you're in seventh grade and all you've known is sit at your desk and listen to me talk and then answer me from your seats. But now I need you to get up and do a lot of stuff. You're probably going to have a lot of kids kind of in shell shock about, wait, what am I supposed to do at school now? I'm, I, I thought I wasn't supposed to get up. So you know what? Maybe if someone times this right, you could really have a little technology to increase variability of students. Money, 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 money. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I think a good combo of both is important. Yeah. Right? So we do need to teach kids sustained attention because that's how life happens, unfortunately. No, you don't, though. You don't anymore. I do. I mean, in my work. Right. Well, yes, because we're, we're, we're teaching a generation of children with disabilities to catch up to their peers who are still learning in a different way. Mm-hmm. The second they stop learning that way, we will have to very quickly teach them to follow along in a totally different environment, which is going to be a lot harder because it's going to be less about sit and listen and answer and more about sit a little bit, listen a little bit, synthesize what you've heard, Mm -hmm. and then interact with your peers to figure out what's going on, which is going to be very, very difficult for children with autism. Yeah, that's going to be hard. Some of the technology piece might not be. I don't think we're ever going to get away from the didactic classroom. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different topic, but it is it is increasingly going to be important that we don't don't engage in the same type of education that was uh, created back in the agrarian <laughs> society. So you're looking for variability on the part of the educators, is what I'm hearing, Rob. Oh, you know what? I didn't even think about that. You're right. Yeah. Hmm. So I'm going to follow them around and be like, "Great job thinking of some different." <laughs> Here's a ticket. Come find me when you're done. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> Two minutes, just talking with me. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> well, then they nice would, job there. What I would love is that if everyone started doing everything the same, <laughs> because it actually was an effective extinction component. <laughs> oh, no. Wouldn't that be, like, kind of funny? I don't think that would be the case. but Not that with me, just, no. That would just be kind of hilarious if everyone's like, now sit down, class. That would be funny. <laughs> Gotta avoid talking to Rob after this. <laughs> I've got all these tickets. <laughs> That's how you make a perfect school. Oh, gosh. Aversive control. Here we go. <laughs> yep, that's how you do it. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, so we saw we saw very similar results. Two studies looking at the same thing, talking about it differently. Yeah. Um, and seeing similar results, which is kind of awesome. Yeah. I, I don't think in the, in the discussion, I do not remember, did the authors posit, here's how you might do it for 
to try to increase persistence? I mean, I know no, it's not a novel it a little... behavior, but it, it, would there be a way you could contextualize persistence as a novel behavior? Like, I'm reinforcing that you're, you know, the lag schedule on the fact that you're moving between, you know, targets. Or yeah. is it the fact that they're similar? In some of the definitions, it felt like if the behaviors were pretty similar, even if they weren't exactly the same, but they were very similar in topography, they weren't counting those as novel behavior. I think actually in the next article they mm-hmm. they specified that. that as, that's what is yeah, important in the next article. Yep. Mm-hmm. So cool. Maybe we do that. Ooh, who knows? Transition. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about our last article in this in this super special three article episode. And this article comes from the analysis of verbal behavior. We're leaving we're leaving Jabba behind for a short while. Goodbye, this- <laughs> Jabba. Goodbye. We'll be back. Don't worry, Jabba. We love you. This article is by Esh, Esh, and Love, and it's... Sounds like a rock band. <laughs> from yes. the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> from 2009. <laughs> from 2009. And the article is titled, Increasing Vocal Variability in Children with Autism Using a Lag Schedule of Reinforcement. So, I'll be honest, when, when I think about research articles, this this was the one that I was like, ah, this, this is a research article. I know. This, none of this block building and internet gaming... <laughs> It's ridiculous. Let's let's get into some stuff that matters. Yeah, you know, leading up to this article, you really poo pooed this whole topic. <laughs> I called from the other room and said, the "Articles, what's up with these articles?" <laughs> yeah, here's newsflash: reinforcement works. <laughs> but this one got you on board. Yes, this one this one made me reconsider the whole the whole uh, topic and the articles. Is it just therein. because you felt like this had more relevance to your day to day? Yes, I mean, well, I, I think when we're, if if they, people haven't figured out from from listening to the episodes, I am always looking for applicability. I know you guys are too, but I need, I need something like today. Like, what am I going to bring to work tomorrow to say? Here's a problem that we're having. I have a new way to think about it. Um, whereas, I think you guys take more time to be critical of the articles. I'm sorry, not critical. I, you take more time to We're like this kind is of... stupid. <laughs> <laughs> We're you not like that. Take more time to sort of parse out like what does this mean to the larger whole? What more do we want to learn from this? Whereas I'm like, aha, this is an answer to a problem I have. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. That's that's, that's fair. That I mean, fair. I think the others didn't really feel like they were quote unquote solving a problem so much as answering a question I already knew the answer to to some Did extent. You? Did you? Well, no. When I read this and went and thought about the whole thing coherently, then then it all sort of snapped okay, together. Okay, no, that, that's fair. But I feel like the question that was being asked is, you know, how do you create creativity? That's the question. And we found the answer. Use lag schedules. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Done. Give them access to me for two <laughs> minutes at a time. That's funny. This was, you know, highly applicable to one's day-to-day. All right. So that, that was nice. Yes, it was. It definitely was. This was yeah. much more applicable, and it allowed me to kind of go back and think about. Because I don't know, solving creativity problems. God, that is the least of my worries on a given day. That's fair, but I love thinking about you know behaviors like radical behaviorism in theory. Oh, yes, gosh, and in the too. moment, you know, if I'm sitting and talk with, with 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 intelligent people, people smarter than me, like I'm doing right now, I like to to do that as well. It's it's a fun exercise, but it, it rarely feels like. Sort of feels like that one project you're always trying to get to at work, and you're like, if I can get all my work done, I might have 15 minutes at the end of the month to get started on that, or to, to do a little bit more on yeah. that. I have a few of those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it, it's that's that sort of sense of I want to think about creativity. I'll get to that. I, I think I have five minutes in between meetings today. <laughs> I'll try to try to do that. So applicability is is king, I think, and and probably for most of our listeners. There, it's what's the problem? What's the fire I got to put out today? Is anything I heard on my drive to work? Like maybe Inside Track, this great podcast, helping me. Or maybe they're listening to Doug Loves Movies or something, and, and, and that's not going to help them at all. So let's get into this one. So Dinah and Jackie, you guys as a special treat, because it's it's from the analysis of verbal behavior, are both going to give us the little intro and procedures sections. Tag team, back again. That's right. Check it, work it, let's Don't begin. stop, no stop, we're going to get sued. You, oh, can't, you can't use Really? Just kidding. Uh, Yeah, so we're going to talk about this article together. So this article is looking at how we can increase variability in in, in vocal repertoires of children. Um, And one thing that I wanted to ask you, Diana, is I wondered if you could clarify for me and for our listeners 
Um, the difference between vocal, verbal, nonverbal, and vocal verbal, because I know that many of my graduate students um, use these these words incorrectly, and I thought that that would be a good starting point to talk about this oh, article. Oh, sure. Yes. <clears throat> so when we're talking about verbal behavior, which is appropriate here because this article is in the analysis of <laughs> verbal behavior. Booyah! <laughs> we're talking about communication in general. Right, so any means of communication that is going to result in being able to request something or comment. So that can include gestures. Absolutely. So yeah. sign language, gestures, um, picture exchange, or speech would all count as verbal behavior. So if we say that an individual is verbal, that indicate that they can do one of those or multiple of those things. If we're saying that an individual is vocal verbal then that means that they're using speech to communicate their wants and needs. And nonverbal would indicate that you don't have any means of communicating wants and needs. And someone who's vocal, but not vocal verbal, would be able to emit sounds or speech sounds, but they may not, but they would not be communicating through those speech sounds. I think that really helps. I think mm -hmm. that'll help us as we come into this um, article. Yes. And talk about, you know, what we're looking for here. Awesome. So, yeah, so... One thing that we should note is that the two children here in the study have a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder, um, and they are not vocal verbal. Ver vocal verbal. So we're looking yeah. at increasing their vocal behavior. So they right now currently cannot um, ask for their wants and needs. Right. So they were vocal in the sense that they had very limited um, speech sounds, but they could each engage in a few one, you know, one or two, basically. Right. Um, so before they did anything, they did a stimulus preference assessment, which you know we love, mm -hmm. um, because we love when we're using stimuli that we know that students prefer. Mm -hmm. um, and so they figured out which preferred edible items they would use and preferred activities they would use for our two participants, Randall and Chandler. Finally, boys. I know. There's some two boys in here. <laughs> the boys with autism. Yeah. <laughs> and then... They um, talk to a speech pathologist, which I think is helpful here, and phonetically transcribed what was occurring during the sessions. Mm -hmm. That was helpful because it, they're, they're not words. They're just phonemic sounds yeah. that they're producing. So it's good that they had someone like that. Um, and then Randall was seven and Chandler was two. So mm. they, we had quite a variation in age. We sure did. For this study. So then they collected data on either the varied vocal response, which was coded as D or different mm -hmm. from the previous response, mm -hmm. or they coded no vocal response, which was coded as N, um, if there was nothing following the model. Mm -hmm. And then they also coded a B, which was base vocal response. So I'm assuming that was if it was the same as the original model. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they started out with uh, one, the one sound that the child was producing, and then they provided 10 different models of different speech sounds throughout the session, and they were uh, each repeated. So it was five different models that were provided during the session. And uh, this was a lag one schedule. So they were looking for a response that was different from the last response emitted by the child. So the base response was the very first response emitted. They then provided the 10 different models, and following each response, they checked to see, was it just like the one that happened previously? If so, they did not receive the reinforcer. They were asked to do a motor task. Mm -hmm. And if it differed from the one that uh, immediately preceded it, then they received the previously identified reinforcer. Yeah. And one thing I love about this study that I highly encourage um, future researchers to include is procedural integrity data. Hmm. So a lot of our earlier studies, you know, most of the time include um, inter-observer inter agreement data, mm -hmm. but people rarely include procedural integrity data. And I would almost, I may argue that that's almost more important than inter-observer agreement because it's really important to know that what they did was actually what they did. Mm -hmm. Um so I, I, I love that they have that in here. And procedural integrity was really high for both participants. So Randall and Chandler, um, their procedural integrity was 94 and 92%, yeah. respectively. Which is so important awesome. because that means that the therapist had to determine within session was the response that was just emitted different than the previous response and then reinforced accordingly. Right. Which might not be that easy 
Um, it this is a scene based on... Some of the examples on, they had. Uh, buh. I mean... Right. It's very subtle. Right. So it's like, buh, buh versus buh versus bub versus mm-hmm. ub. We're or actually going to play a game. Responses. We're going to play a game here. Yeah. So Diana's going to be the therapist, and I'm going to be the student. And then we're going to have you be the data collector and try to figure out, should I receive reinforcement or not? Okay. Fun game! I'm ready for the challenge. <laughs> okay. So I'm the therapist. You are. Okay. Am I going per and Jomini is the codes from the article, or I just need to say novel? You just have to say D, B, or N. D or is R. different. B is base. R is repeat. Oh, yeah. N is no response. I thought base only came in if there was no response... Or if they made the same sound and they made a different sound, it got scored as a B because it had to be repetition and then bass. Like, this is the first one. The next one is the one that would matter. The very first response in the session, they based, they considered that a bass response based on what had happened in the previous session. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. the most common response in the previous session was now the bass response. Mm -hmm. So because reinforcement needed to occur, to occur only for responses that were not like the preceding response, so they used the base response as the preceding response. So that was what started off the session, and then during the session, uh, following a no response, Mm -hmm. the next response was considered a base response again. No matter what it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense? Yeah, that's what I described. Yeah, that's what you said. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So maybe you should just um, let us know when reinforcement should be given, Okay. which you could indicate... However you so choose. How are you gonna how are you gonna indicate reinforcement, Rob? I'll just say Yes. Okay. Oh, I love that. That would be reinforcement. Yes. You know what I say? Shamo. Or No, I'm fine. <laughs> Shazam! <laughs> oh, the you Dino go, I you, like that one. Okay. You go, girl. Okay, so the base response for this session is mmm. So Jackie, we're looking to hear something different from you than mmm. And after you emit that and then emit something else, reinforcement can start. Okay? So I'm going to model the base response. Mmm. Ah. Oh. Ah. A. A. Ah. I. Ba. Dynamite! Fa fa. Ba ba. Dynamite! Fa fa. Ah. Dynamite! I. I. Bubba. Bubba. O. Ah. Dynamite! Bubba. B. Dynamite! That was fun! Awesome! How'd I do? Did <laughs> I get them all? Great. You got perfect! You got 100%! <laughs> yeah, that was, that was crazy. That was crazy. I feel like that would be so hard to to do in in vivo. Right. And the nice thing is that they did um, uh, videotape the sessions, which is helpful. And they got it nice. So that procedural integrity is really important there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So way to go them. Yeah. I wonder how they recorded as they went what these were. Like, did they write them out phonetically so they could keep track of what was going to come next? I don't know, but don't it seems crazy. Um, also, a little unclear in this article is how they chose the, the models that they were going to use. You know, Jackie and I kind of scoured through it, and we didn't really find a good indication. I think it must have just been based on the sounds that they had heard the individuals Mm -hmm. produce. So somewhere in the repertoire. Previously, yeah, yeah. Um, They don't really write out what those, how they chose those. Okay. All right. So that's what they did, Mm -hmm. and every session was the same ten, um, ten models, but the base response did change depending on what had happened in the previous session. Uh, do you want me to talk through the graphs and yeah, things like that? Yeah, you're doing a good job. Okay. Um, so in baseline, they did not provide additional reinforcement for engaging in novel responses. Um, in the treatment condition, it was, like we said, a lag one schedule. So any response that differed just from the immediately preceding response was reinforced. And we saw increases for both Randall and Chandler. Uh, in this condition, return to baseline saw actually quite varying levels of, of behavior for both of them. But... Mm-hmm. Um, more data points overlapping with the baseline conditions. And then the lag schedule was reintroduced, and for both of them we saw a responding increase under those conditions, although it was more variable for Chandler. He had uh, several sessions in which he had a decline in his overall number of novel vocalizations. We're not sure why. 
Um, but both of them ended on a high note, and it looked like this was effective for them at increasing these different uh, vocalizations. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's really nice because, I mean, when you're trying to teach vocalizations, um, you do want varied. You, want, you mm-hmm. want to make sure that you have varied sounds mm-hmm. um, that's going to help, you know, synthesize into words, into meaning, mm-hmm. into life. Mm-hmm. That was deep. I know. Yeah, so pretty I mean, cool. If you're not starting with a base, with a more variable base of responding, that's going to be much more difficult to shape that into right. functional mm-hmm. speech mm-hmm. than if you already have uh, an individual who can produce you know, several different consonant sounds or vowel sounds, then you're ahead of the game there. Right. And it may actually be helpful for, you know, especially for kids with uh, with a diagnosis of autism because frequently our kids learn a co-op behavior very well. Mm-hmm. So... Anytime you say anything to them, they just repeat it back to you. So, like, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hi, mm-hmm. how are you? Um, so this is going to actually be very helpful in, I think, that sense. Um, we can use it instead of with vocalizations and, you know, teach, like, greetings or other times when you have to respond differently. Like, how are you? You don't say I'm good all the time. You can say I'm good, I'm great, I'm wonderful. Um, you could use this type of procedure to help with that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, often Take we are... Take it to are... work. <laughs> what, would that, what would that look like? Just multiple people coming up to this kid standing there. Hi. And then the kid says, hi. And the next person comes up and goes, hi. And if the kid says, what's up? Then they get, mm-hmm. their, yeah. they get their green card and they can talk to me for two minutes. Right. Yeah. Pretty easy, actually. That sounds like one of the ideas that I would love to implement. And then you tell all the teachers about it. Like, that's too hard. I don't want to do that. That's stupid. Well, it is really hard. It's hard and easy at the same time, You know what it makes you think of? It makes you think of David Spade as the steward when they're getting off the airplane. Bye-bye. 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 See you. Bye-bye. I love you. Right? Yeah, that's very true. You know, I think often in our field we're so focused on getting behavior, or should be verbal behavior, excuse me, vocal behavior under imitative control. Right. right. So you say this, and, or I say this, and then you say this back, which is a very important part in establishing functional speech. Mm-hmm. However, this could be a really important preceding step that may be necessary for some students in order to increase just the many different types of things that they can produce vocally so that we can then start to get it underneath vocal imitative control. Mm-hmm. And they didn't have any data on whether or not the students began imitating more accurately, right? I, I, I didn't. I Not didn't, that they I didn't represented note any. here. I don't first. think they really cared as much um, about that. Right. Well, I know they didn't care as much about that. Right. But. They they noted that in the ten model trials, they had a few trials in which the model was repeated, mm-hmm. um, and they did that in order to help control for uh, echoic responding. Right. Mm-hmm. So if every if the model was different every single time, and the child just imitated the model then they would be contacting that lag one differential reinforcement, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so they occasionally had the response, or excuse me, the model twice in a row the same so that they could help to monitor for that and, mm-hmm. and not allow reinforcement to continue just for echoic responding. Yeah. So they would, but there was no reinforcement at all for, for echoic, so it shouldn't have come under any sort of control. It shouldn't. Well, if the, if the child is modeling the, the response of the adult... No, they, they it were, changes they were, every single time. Yeah, they, they were, they they were being rein, be. but they were re, being reinforced necessarily. Adventitiously, for, they yeah, 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 exactly. Yes. Adventitiously, they, yeah. they could be reinforced, but they weren't. They weren't directly reinforced for any sort of their echoics. It was just about the correct the the variability variety of vocalization. Yeah, cool. I did find myself wondering at the end if they if it right. they were the starting to imitate the sounds more. Um, but we don't we don't know. They were just looking to reinforce any novel response. Right. It was a good study. Yeah, it was a good study. Well, I like the idea of the extension of not just increasing vocalizations or, or the variety of vocalizations, which is certainly important, but in looking at the so looking at how could you extend that to students who do have vocal verbal behavior into well, how could we make their their language more not adaptable, but more more varied? How could we mm-hmm. make their language more interesting to right. different speakers? Mm-hmm. Um, because you know, again, depending on your student, they may or may not be very sensitive to who was their yeah. audience at the time, just right. so much as I've learned to say this in the presence of adults or children, mm-hmm. and yeah. I just and say I the same thing. I think we thing. often wait for that, you know, and we just do. hope yeah. that natural social contingencies are going to bring that type of variability into play, and it often doesn't play yeah. out that way, you know. Um, 
So I wonder if we shouldn't start sooner in working on, like, the types of variability like you're talking about. Like, how can you respond differently to high? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Hey, guys, take it to work tomorrow. Take it to work. <laughs> we'll just change that. We'll just change that little song up. So actually, right before we pull into dissemination station, I did want to give. <laughs> I did want to give anyone who is going to be applying for CEs our last secret code word, and that is puppy. P U P P Y puppy. Because you know I like them. <laughs> but don't have children, just puppies. <laughs> just puppies. So puppy. Oh wait a minute! What's that? Oh. We're pulling right in to Dissemination Station. I bet that sounded awesome. That I good. think it did. Like a foley artist. It sounded good here in the studio. I'll tell you that. Yes! <laughs> okay, so what is our big take home point? With our lag schedule well, and our novel behaviors. Rob, since you didn't feel like the. Two previous articles had any application. <laughs> I don't... It's not that I feel they did not have any application. It was that they were looking at a, an issue that almost felt like a foregone conclusion to me. Yes, use reinforcement and it will change rates of a behavior. If you reinforce something that hasn't been reinforced in the past, you will increase a behavior that is novel. It didn't feel... As exciting as, say, the uh, increasing vocal variability study in which That's you're true. talking about this is a real problem, this is a solution to that real but problem. But what if you want your dolphins to be able to do more gymnastics? Or what if you want That's your... not a real problem. <laughs> it is a problem in SeaWorld. <laughs> because they put the dolphins in SeaWorld. <laughs> it's also a problem if I love block building and I have a kid that's boring block building. Like, Problem. But it's not a problem because it, who cares? It is, and it's applicable to so many different things. Right. Yes. It, it's, it, it's working to answer a theoretical question of how do creative, how does creativity come to be? And that's one of the things in our field that we have had problems answering in the past, right? So people believe that we make robots mm-hmm. um, and we teach kids only to respond one way all over the place. So using using this line of research you know, promotes the idea that behavior analysts actually can promote creativity and spontaneity in a in in the layman sense of the term. Yeah. But, but are you talking creativity in the sense of, you know, working with children who are doing hundreds of discrete trial training you know, sessions? So creativity there? Or are you talking creativity? You know, hey, can we make everyone a fancy sculptor kind of creativity? I think both. I think... I think the line of lag schedules can facilitate both. I think there is a study out there looking at, oh, I can't remember what it, the year or the author, but looking at uh, different paintings, so different brush strokes, um, and showing that they could make novel paintings based on the brush strokes oh, yeah? that they learned. Yeah, but I can't remember where oh, it was. I don't know. I know the one where the pigeons could discriminate the different art. Right, Monet and Picasso. Yeah, I love that. Um, that's looking more at stimulus control, though. Fine. Yeah, not really. <laughs> not right. really what we're talking about today. But, I mean, I think getting these more basic questions answered, can we change something as simple as block building, can help us promote the procedures that are going to help us create painters and mm-hmm. sculptors and great thinkers. I want to look, look at writing. Writing for a second. E- educational writing. Okay. So... One of the challenges that comes into writing is that very much in the line of teaching teaching students to the test, if you want to write a quick short answer essay that is going to get maximum points, you will have an interesting opening, you will have a topic sentence that describes one of the answers to the question, you will have two to three details, you will have another topic sentence that describes the second part of your answers. The second reason that the Declaration of Independence is an important article uh, for our, our country is buh, 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 buh. this was noted in buh, 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 buh. And, and you just write five paragraphs with the last one being a concluding sentence and that's why the Declaration of Independence is important and you can get maximum answers and yeah. to be honest you'd be a sucker not to just write that because it's the most efficient way to solve the problem which is not I'm going to write a great answer it's I need to score well on this test well, it seems like your testing is not what testing yeah, what you're looking what, for. No, no, exactly. But if you really wanted to teach kids to be good writers, 
wouldn't one of the areas to look at would be let me code the different kinds of sentences. Let me code the different syntactical uh, creations that we have. So I'm going to have uh, this kind of a clause, or I'm going to use uh, the passive voice. I'm going to use an active verb to sort of boil it down to its essence, sit next to the student, and every time they write a sentence, the next sentence, if it meets one of the criteria, you know, one of the criteria, and it's not the same one, whoa, that's a great sentence, and just get a lot of novelty in, in terms of what types of sentences they were writing. As long as it makes sense. So in, in writing, you have to actually have a cohesive body of literature. So each yeah. sentence has to be in the same tense as the previous sentence. Otherwise... When you read a paragraph, it makes no sense at all. Well, right? so, no, you would. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be reinforcing novel verb tenses. That wouldn't oh, be one okay, of the. Good. It would be more sort of the structures, or uh, am I using some sort of uh, descriptive clause in this? Uh, you, you, I guess you, in novel writing, yeah. I don't think in the writing like of writing of the independent the Declaration of Independence might be helpful because that's more of a. You're asking them to tell you what they know, not about reading. No, but at this, not it, about writing. But in the same respect, if we're talking about creativity. My goal as a teacher is not to teach kids how to pass a test. My goal is to teach them how to take information that they have learned and make something that's interesting. Yeah, okay. <laughs> make something that is, you know, I, I know we, we're, we're not necessarily talking when we talk about creativity about the idea of, well, creative types are ones who are just reinforced by by that variability, mm-hmm. by that novelty. To some extent, it would be nice if everyone were somewhat reinforced by that, but I, I think there's going to be a limit to how much creativity you can you can get in, sure. in in the school setting, at least. But I think that's why we don't teach creativity because you've got the kids who are just naturally good at it; they get praised a lot for it. But they probably also there's something about the the, the, the creative process that is is reinforcing, so they continue to use it. Whereas there are the kids who are not reinforced by that. Is it a question of we could teach them to be reinforced? I think so. I think not? we could not teach them not teach them to be reinforced by the creative process and hypothetical, but teach them to be creative by promoting novel variability in their writing or in their thought process. Hmm? I think we could do that. Hmm? Seems seems doable. Like I said, bring it to work. Do it. Yeah. I feel like writing is kind of a funny one to... It's hard because you do have... Because there are a lot of rules that yeah. need to be followed in order for the writing to make sense. Mm-hmm. If you're just talking about you know, free-form, creative writing that's going to end up sounding like T.S. Eliot, then you can take a lot of liberties. Yeah, like the Virginia Woolf to the lighthouses. Yeah, some nice James Joyce. (laughs) You can do all kinds of things that you want to. But, you know, the example that came to my mind was um, when as kids learn to tell jokes, Mm -hmm. right? So... Punish all children jokes. They're terrible. <laughs> but kids will hit on a joke that's funny, or they'll hear one joke that's funny, and then they'll say that same joke over and over and over again. And you have said, even at this very dinner table, you can't tell the joke two times in a row, son, because it's not funny after the first time. <laughs> or it was not funny the first time. <laughs> so jokes need to operate on the lag, like, 20-day <laughs> schedule (laughs) in order to be reinforced right and it takes some practice to learn what's going to be reinforced and what's not Mm -hmm. so to me that is the type of application that i could see this being useful Mm -hmm. for something that's a little more social behavior yeah Mm -hmm. totally or um the other thing that came to mind is is like your own dress code, the way that you dress yourself. So you might have an outfit that gets a lot of compliments, but you can't wear it too often or people will stop complimenting you on it or they'll think that that's the only thing that you have to wear. So you have to, you know, balance that and figure out how often you can wear something in order for it to maintain the its reinforcement, the reinforcement schedule mm-hmm. for it. Right? So it might be a lag of like two weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure. No one's done that study that I know of. A lag 14 schedule for Mm -hmm. your favorite dress Mm -hmm. in order for a reinforcement to occur. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So in that regard, though, how would the use of a lag schedule be different than, say, shaping? So you wear the same outfit over and over. You just don't get any more compliments, so you stop wearing that outfit, and then you get compliments again. Well, shaping is um, reinforcing successive approximations toward uh, some particular oh, okay, goal. Okay, maybe that's not the... No, well, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry, not you. How is it just not the same as reinforcement and extinction? 
How does the lag schedule differ? It's incorporated it, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it is using reinforcement and extinction, just operating on some particular schedule. So should we be calling more things lag schedule than just talking about them as reinforcement and extinction? If you're looking at variability. Yeah. I think yeah. if you're looking at variability, yes, because mm-hmm. that's the definition of it. Mm-hmm. But we're not usually looking at variability. Mm-hmm. But maybe we should. Right. I think we need more variability. Me too. Mm-hmm. I need more variability in my life. Yeah. There's something comforting about having no variability, though. That's true. That's why most people are creatures of habit. I mean, I'm thinking about these types of things. Like, what do I want to eat or what do I want to wear? Mm-hmm. What earrings do I want to have in today? What do I want to listen to on the radio? Mm-hmm. Like, I like having a lot of variability in that sense. Oh, I do as well. Okay. I don't. I don't like the idea of doing the same thing over and over. That's why I have seven hobbies, and which I don't actually. Right. Yeah. I'm not actually good at a single one of them because I switch around a lot. I think you're great at podcasting. Why? Thank you. You have a great <laughs> podcasting voice. <laughs> I appreciate that. But then you can't reinforce me for podcasting the next time. You have to reinforce me if I do something different. Right. <laughs> cool. So I think we hit it. I think we talked yeah, a lot there, about that. We didn't schedules. talk a lot about future research in our dissemination train here. You've but, got that um, great article about um, getting people to wear different outfits. Yeah. <laughs> or up. It's um, needed. Yeah. Or <laughs> it's really needed. <laughs> Get on it, people. <laughs> well, looking at variability in social greeting, social conversations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's so much there's play. There's so much I mean, do. novel play. How are we going to reinforce novel play? Right. There's it's tons of stuff we need that's to do. question that plagues me I mean, I still every want, day. I want to keep thinking about the idea of teaching writing. I mean, if you think about writing as the same thing as increasing vocalizations, what if the original goal is just get kids to write tons of different sentences? Mm-hmm. Then, that would be awesome. Now that you have a bank of tons and tons of different ways that you can write a sentence... Now you talk about okay, let's make it a coherent. Yeah, statement. I like that. That makes a lot more sense to okay. me now. I love this idea, and I think that that would be fun. My one of my colleagues and I have been talking about how we can do an effective study looking at trying to improve student writing mm-hmm. overall without oh. multiple um, manuscript turnovers mm-hmm. on our part. Um, Love it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm wondering if this might be uh, a way that we could do that is look at in classes promoting variability and then shaping yeah. that behavior once we have the behavior mm-hmm. Yeah, occurring. that's pretty cool. Hmm. You know, when I've done creative writing classes in the past, one of the things that they have you do is write straight for like 10 or 15 minutes. Like you can't pick up your pencil from the page. You cannot stop moving mm-hmm. your pencil. So, and they say, even if you need to write the same thing over and over, do it. And as you do that, you come to more and more different ideas and more and more different things that you're writing down, which you then, you know, t- parse through all the gobbledygook that you have on your page right. and find the gems and then, sh- you know, mo- shape that into something that's actually good. Mm-hmm. But... That's another way that maybe produces variability that I don't know if has been studied. Yeah, that would be fun. Mm-hmm. Very much. I think it's a, such a great topic. It mm-hmm. is a really good topic. I love thinking about novel behavior. There's not a lot of research out there, so mm-hmm. it's wide open. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Okay. All right. If you do the writing one, I just I set it so it's copyright me now, so you got to pay me. Sure. You Sorry. Can, DM. You can, it's you the Rob Perry Cruz method. Oh. <laughs> oh, I will pay you one <laughs> cent. I just want tickets for two minutes of your time. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I need for reinforcement. Here you go. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks everybody so much for listening to this episode of ABA Inside Trek. We hope you enjoyed reading the articles and we hope you enjoyed the discussion. We'll be back in one week with a preview episode. In the meantime, though, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, uh, as ABA Inside Track. You can email us your thoughts on ABA Inside Track at gmail.com. You know, feel free to continue writing reviews for Please. the show on iTunes. We Do really appreciate it. it. Uh, we're trying to get this out to as many people as possible, and reviews on iTunes is one way to sort of increase our visibility on iTunes. We're trying to get the word out about applied behavior analysis. So, to some extent, if you're not listening to our show, you're, 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 you're squelching applied behavior analysis in the popular culture, and you don't want to do that. Well, anyone who got to this point will have listened, so... You're right. You guys are in the clear. Tell everyone Just else tell your friends. that, that they're, they're squelching, squelching uh, dissemination station. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, that's where we are. That's where you can find us. But uh, if you want to find Jackie, where can we find you, Jackie? So you can find me and you can hang out with me weekly. If you're interested in a career uh, in behavior analysis, you can check out uh, the Master's of Science um, degree in Applied Behavior Analysis through Regis College. Um, it's a really good program, and you would learn a lot and have a lot of fun. We have part-time and full-time options available. Mm-hmm. See you there. You don't need variable behavior because you just it's just non-contingent reinforcement with Jackie. You know it. That's right. <laughs> just be there. <laughs> well, everyone, thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Diana, for being here. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, okay. Rob. For everyone else, we'll see you next week for our preview episode, and we'll see you in two weeks for the full episode. And remember, until then, keep responding. Keep responding. Bye. Bye. <laughs>